A year ago, an opportunity arose to redo one of those TV show tanks. This opportunity provided us with a situation where we could excel at creating a realistic looking reef inside the tank along with adding current technology and taking it beyond its initial creation. This video chronicles the completion of that state-of-the-art system. To get to the next step in keeping and growing corals, we're almost done adding a Geo's Reef calcium reactor to the system. Okay, we'll check our height here, make sure we have clearance. Thank you. All right, so um, we've got our pH probe in. We've got everything plumbed. At this point, I'm gonna start up the mower. And in this case, it's just a matter of pushing that button there. Now it's running. Um, it thinks we're running at 60 milliliters a minute. I'm gonna slow this down quite a bit. We don't need to run it that fast. Bring it down to 43. Now these things are calibratable. Um, at this point, I'm not really so much concerned about exactly what the milliliters a minute are. We're not dosing anything. Ultimately, you know, the adjustments are gonna be made based on what the tank needs. So, you know, we're gonna aim for an alkalinity between seven and a half and eight. Um, you normally wanna dose the tank and get it to your target area before you turn on the calcium reactor. In our case, um, the calcium reactor is gonna have to run for 24 hours to purge any air and stuff like that in there before we even turn on the CO2 and introduce gas. But um, once we turn on the gas, uh, at that point, you're supposed to test your alkalinity calcium daily. Really, alkalinity is a magic number because the calcium reactor is going to dissolve them both. So track your alkalinity daily, and if you see that your alkalinity is dropping in the tank after you've done your dosing, you get it to a set point, then you need to increase the effluent rate going through the reactor or decrease the pH. Um, Rebore media typically dissolves at around 6.5 to 6.65. I like to keep it at around 6, 6, 6.65. So will aim to keep a certain pH within the reactor and adjust the flow according to the tank's needs. So if we increase the flow, the effluent rate through the reactor, meaning if we increase the speed of this pump, then we're gonna need to slightly increase the CO2 rate to maintain the same level. If we slow the pump down, then we wanna slow the amount of CO2 going into the reactor. And in our case, it's just simply a matter of turning a dial here. Now, we're gonna turn on the CO2 feed and with this particular regulator setup, I like to maintain about three PSI here. So we're gonna adjust this valve to about three PSI. Now, unfortunately, I have the CO2 off. I'm gonna turn that on briefly right now, just so I can set the PSI on the reactor. Because if you have the PSI too high, then it ends up making it more difficult to... So, what were you doing with your iPhone there? I was just accessing his Apex and turning that the CO2 outlet on. And I want to make this... So, 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 stop for a second. So, this carbon doser is now connected to the Apex? That's correct. It's connected to the Apex. It's set up for pH control so that if the pH in here drops below 6.6, .6, the Apex is going to shut it off if the pH in here drops below 6.6. .6. And right now I'm aiming to have about three to four PSI there. So, and you can see the dial here is set to one bubble every four seconds. So every four or so seconds, a little under four seconds, the solenoid's gonna open up and you'll see a little bubble go through the reactor. All right, I don't see where the bubbles go, okay. So there's the bubble window right there. Right. So each time that little light blinks, there should be a corresponding bubble. That's correct.
Now, the greater the pressure on this side, the larger the bubble. Now, I'm setting this up based on my experience with this particular regulator, my reactor, my system. Um, that way, you know, I can give Jim some guidance because I'm not going to be here every day to check this thing, let alone every week. So, Jim's going to have to make his adjustments when he comes down here based on where the tank is at. Jim's head is already swimming. Yeah, Jim will be calling or texting Scott <laughs> when he comes down here. All right, so I think we've got the PSI set nicely. I'm going to go back in here. I'm going to shut that outlet off. All right, calcium reactor CO2 is now off. Now, where was that fancy seal that I bought? That is actually in the regulator. So we used a, a perma seal from aquarium um, plants, people that make the carbon doser, and that goes inside of the regulator itself. Um, and it basically has an O-ring. Typically, with CO2 tanks, you have a little plastic um, O-ring that's not reusable, and they make this thing called the perma seal that goes inside of the regulator, inside the stem, has an O-ring in there and essentially you never have to change the seal uh, and, and they're dynamite they don't leak I mean, back in the old days i was going through co2 tanks every six months for a number of reasons one maybe because we had every you know we had a faulty tank uh, or a faulty seal um, plus we also really didn't chase our ph couldn't really track our ph back in the day 20 years ago we didn't have ph probes in the reactor so we count bubbles and you go through a 20 pound co2 tank in a matter of what seemed like minutes now, um, on my 20 pound tank, which is about four times the size of this, I get two years out of the tank, which is quite a long time. Um, this, in my opinion, is a small tank for this size system, but for Jim's sake, it's convenient because he can get that tank refilled at his wholesalers and not have to run around town. So he might be changing this tank out every four months or so, maybe five months if he's lucky. And where is it I'm going to determine how much CO2 is left in the bottle? This dial here, once it gets down to about 500 PSI, 5, 600, then it's time to start thinking about changing the bottle. Right now you're at 1,000 PSI, and it'll you know, come down depending on the temperature outside. If it's colder out, um, the PSI may drop a little bit. If it's warmer, it's going to be higher. Uh, but usually when it's around 500 PSI, it's time to start thinking about replacing the bottle, and Jim's got extra bottles here. so. And then with these pumps too, this head's good for about a year. The tubing probably needs to be replaced every six months or so, depending on the speed that we're running it at. Right now, I've got it running at what I think is probably a high, um, high flow rate. We'll see here shortly. I'm waiting to see it start dripping out here, but it's not dripping yet. So you know, we're still priming. In fact, dripping out where? They'll start coming out that tube there. There's our effluent line. And that was also a good time to inspect and make sure that we don't have any leaks anywhere on the reactor. Um, and so far, I think everything looks great. You know, we did fill these up, but there's always going to be an air gap in there, which we want to purge out. So we'll keep this thing running until we start seeing the water coming out of there. And just so we can explain how this is working with the two geo reactors, um, our pump is feeding the intake here. So water from the system is going in through here. The circulation pump will recirculate it throughout the reactor. Uh, it comes out the top of the reactor and then goes into the bottom of the secondary reactor. So that the low pH effluent can go up through the media here and it'll bring up the pH slightly. It'll also buffer it a little bit more with calcium and alkalinity on its way out of the secondary geo reactor and back into a cell. And as you can see, this pump is drawing from inside the sump down in there. So right now we've got this pump screaming and adjustment there too, it looks like. And eventually water will start coming out of there, but you know, right now we're pumping, you know, less than 100 milliliters a minute, so. Shake it around to you, get some of the air bubbles out of there. I 
all that media has air in it. So. I can actually look underneath and see the air that's trapped in the lens still. Starting to purge some water out of there, but we gotta purge all the air out too. What I might do just to make my life a little bit easier is grab a bucket and disconnect this. Hose on there. Put that back up. Tell we're pushing the air out because. It's going to take a good 24 hours to get all the air out of this thing. Now one other little bit of advice if you're setting up a reactor, you want to have it as level as possible because the effluent comes out the center there, so any excess air is going to want to go to the highest spot in there, and if the thing is unlevel, all your air will collect over here, and then the circulation pump will suck that air back in, and you'll end up with a cloudy reactor. So you want to have it level, and for what it's worth, it actually looks pretty level, all things considered. Hello, my name is Jim Stein and I operate Aquarium Design and I offer Aquarium Sales, Installation, Supplies, Livestock and Aquarium Maintenance in Thousand Oaks, Westlake Village, Agora Hills, Calabasas and Malibu, California. I specialize in custom aquariums ranging from freshwater, saltwater fish, living coral reef and jellyfish display systems. I've been involved professionally and at many levels within the aquarium industry since 1987 and have been in business for myself since 1999. I've worked for many people and some for over 20 years now. My team can provide you with a unique range of aquarium systems ranging from rectangular inwall to freestanding cylinders, bow fronts and custom curved shapes. Additionally, we can offer a variety of aquascapes such as an artificial coral insert, coral skeleton decorations, custom-made branching rock structures, and themed environments such as this Jules Verne version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. With today's technology in energy efficient DC water pumps and LED lighting, operating costs are much lower. We can automate many of the maintenance features such as water replenishment, water changes, lighting schedule, including moonlight lighting, and even your general daily feedings. I can even install an app on your smartphone that will allow you to monitor, to be notified, to control, and view your aquarium anywhere in the world. 
If you're looking for something truly unique, give me a call and let's discuss the possibilities of creating your aquatic dream. I'm knowledgeable, insured, and very reliable. My name is Jim Stein, and you can reach me at 805-241-7140. I look forward to helping you achieve your aquatic dream. Reef Hobbyist Magazine believes that our hobby, our fellow hobbyists, and the animals in our care are best served by the free distribution of quality information. Reef Hobbyist Magazine provides hobbyists with critical husbandry information with an emphasis on marine ornamental breeding efforts. Reef Hobbyist Magazine is available for free in local fish stores across the country or you can subscribe at www.reefhobbyistmagazine.com. Do you enjoy watching LA Fish Guys? Do you feel like a fish guy when servicing your own aquarium? Would you like to feel like part of the LA Fish Guy team? For a limited time, get your LA Fish Guys t-shirts or embroidered polo shirts today. These 100% cotton Hanes beefy tees are $20 and the embroidered black polo t-shirts are 50% cotton and 50% polyester and are only $25. Visit myfishtank.com. Look for the LA Fish Guys link and order your LA Fish Guys shirts today before they sell out. Some sizes may be limited and may not be available. And be sure to visit the LA Fish Guys website to see all 152 reinstated LA Fish Guys episodes, including the original 35 shows. And always, keep moving forward. All right, so our next step is to set up this fan. Now, you might recognize this fan. This is your typical fan that you find on a car. Um, runs on 12 volts. These are used to cool your radiators. Uh, this fan was originally set up to pull through it. Uh, but what we don't want to do is be sucking a bunch of air from the outside directly across the chiller. Not only will it make it dusty, but it's hot out. It'll just be pumping hot air across there anyway. So we had to reverse the uh, fan rotation by unscrewing the little fan thing there, flipping the fan over, and changing the polarity to the uh, fan, being swapping the positive and negative. Now, since this is 12 volt, I had Jim get a little AC adapter that has a cigarette lighter plug on it, and then I soldered on, shrink tube on, little cigarette lighter, male cigarette lighter connection, so that if he ever needs to swap a fan or change the power supply, because that's the first thing that probably will out would be the power supply, he just rebuy the same power supply and plug it right in. Easy peasy. So 12 volt AC adapter and our little radiator fan, and we're going to screw this right on inside there. Um, the other alternative, and you're probably wondering, well, why did you just use a duct fan? Well, most duct fans um, that we looked at, they're eight inches deep and we really don't have that kind of space in there. So this being really low profile was a simple solution um, or the 10 cent solution to a 50 cent problem because this fan was uh, relatively inexpensive compared to what a high CFM duct fan would have been. So I'm gonna screw this in um, using these little tabs here. They'll go in like that and then a little screw through them into the framing. And we'll have some airflow so that the chiller doesn't overheat during the summer. Uh, historically, when it gets really hot out, they got to leave the lid open. And what we're trying to do is avoid having to open the cabinet. And this should do the trick. So we'll go ahead and screw this puppy in. And if I recall right, you were going to also hook the power portion of that in to the, so, apex. to the apex so that the fan only came on when the chiller came on. Well, yeah, the fan will probably come on before the chiller comes on, but yes. Idea. So what's the trigger? The, the temperature or? The temperature is going to go off the tank temperature. We oh, have, We have okay. the Apex program to be in a slightly different range than the chiller. The Apex turns the chiller on a degree or two before the chiller comes on. So that the Apex essentially acts as the failsafe for chiller. Alright, so we got that all done. We can a little AC adapter here. 
plug that into the available outlet on the energy bar. Ooh, a bit of a head rush from yeah. standing up so quick. So this tank has now consumed all eight outlets on two separate eight outlet energy bars. Plus what's in the house. Plus what's in the house. So there's a lot of uh, electricity being drawn and a lot of different components. It's alive! That's going to be sucking not only the air, but the water out of the filter. Alright, the next thing to do is to program that. So right now what we've done is we've gone ahead and programmed that outlet to turn the fan on at uh, 81 degrees and off at 80.8. So once it hits 80.7, the fan um, should shut off. Uh, we can actually probably test that real quickly if we wanted to. I don't know which one of these is which. temperature probes in there, one is for saline. Right. We only want to raise these up a tad. The chiller just came on. And I think the fan just went off. It did. So alright, so we know that's working. So by pulling the uh, temperature probe out, what did that do? Well, you, it's wet, so basically and it, it cooled the probe oh, off. Oh, it cooled down, uh, interpreted as being cooler, okay. So now it reads the temperature in here, well, 79.9, but that's because I played with the probe. So that's good. So that all works now. Um, let's make another label. Label printer here. Got to have everything labeled nicely. So professional. Now we've just got to be disconnected. All right, so last thing to do for Jim is to recalibrate his salinity probe, and uh, I'll be looking forward to Miller time. And uh, what we've done is we've been soaking our salinity solution in the sump to make sure that it's the right temperature. So I'm going to go ahead and pull it out. Which one is it?
So the Apex has a, a calibration program uh, that he's going through and accessing that through the display module. So the first step is to dry the probe. Got it out of the water, so of course it'll do its little settling thing there and it appears as though it's already settled. We'll go ahead and open our conductivity solution packet. Select OK. And when this is 53 solutions, so we'll select 53. Okay. Place it in our packet. Now, notice I'm putting in the tank water, and the idea is that you want, for the calibration to be accurate, you want it to be the same temperature as the tank water. We have a temperature probe in the tank, and there's temperature compensation that basically, as the temperature in the tank changes, so does the conductivity or the specific gravity of the water. So, uh, controllers will utilize temperature compensation, meaning the temp probe that's in the sump, to calculate an accurate uh, conductivity. I will also point out that uh, it's very important that you have your probes in a location that is devoid of micro bubbles and out of the light. So this spot of the sump where we have these probes is about the, uh, you know, is a good spot that really doesn't have any kind of micro bubbles in there. The other thing that you want um, is to make sure that the probe cables are out of the wire, out of the water. Um, right now that probe holder is a little bit low. It's something I want to change. And like the other stuff, I'll rotate, or like the pH. Now you want to rotate this around in there, make sure that there's no micro bubbles in there. And you'll see a little countdown on the display there. It's changing, it's got a full 495 on that. It doesn't matter what that reads, it just matters that it stops changing. And once it stops changing, then you know it's fully settled. still moving a bit, so. A lot of times I'll just set this up in an area of my tank when I'm doing my own calibration and walk away for 10 minutes. Done calibrating. Thirty-four point one is what you're reading on there now. All right, so we got the calcium reactors all set up. Uh, it's going to run for 24 hours without any CO2, and then tomorrow, remotely, we'll turn on the CO2. Jim has made some adjustments to the alkalinity and calcium in the tank. He did a dose to get it to uh, what levels we normally keep the tank at. Uh, from there, if the when he comes back in a couple days and does his test, if the alkalinity in the tank is dropped, we'll increase the flow rate through the reactor and make a slight adjustment to the CO2 rate to increase it slightly to compensate for the faster flow going through the reactor. Um, if, in fact, the uh, alkalinity has gone up in the tank, then we'll slow the flow down through the reactor and we'll make a slight adjustment to drop the CO2 rate so that it's a little bit slower. Uh, at the end of the day, it really doesn't make much of a difference for us on the CO2 rate. Um, dropping because the apex is going to shut off the CO2 anyways after it gets to about 6.6 .6 in the reactor, 6.6 um, .6 .6 pH, but um, the idea is to be able to adjust the pH in the reactor, the CO2 rate, and the flow such that 
the apex never has to intervene because our flow won't change unless we make a change. So in closing, um, we've got everything set up. We are now pretty much hands-free. Uh, got our feed pump going through the reactor to keep the uh, flow rates consistent. We don't have any needle valves to adjust, so we should never have to worry about clogs in the reactor. And the only adjustments that will ever need to be made will be made to keep up with alkalinity. So let's go ahead and close up the lids and then we'll go in and take a quick peek at the tank and kind of talk about where its future is going to be. So now that we've got the calcium reactor in there, give it a couple of months, but we're going to start adding more corals to the system. I'd like to get into some of the nice colorful staghorn corals. And of course at the same time I'm expecting the rest of the coral to begin to increase its size. But until next time, keep moving forward. forward.